Welcome to Books and Beyond, Gates Public Library, 60 Years of Service. Well, I believe very strongly that libraries are a part of the social infrastructure that supports a person's lifelong learning. So there are no stupid questions. That's what I've learned in my library life. I would like to dedicate this to the wonderful people who have supported the library all over the years. We wouldn't have a library if it weren't for our users, our wonderful volunteers, our wonderful friends of Gates Public Library, the library board, all volunteers themselves and the hardworking staff from shelving pages to librarians. So um, it is a wonderful amount of support that we have. In the beginning, Back in June of 1959, Harold Hacker, who was then the director of the Monroe County Library System, and Dorothy Sebast, who was the head of the Monroe County Library System Board, came to speak to the Gates Tri-Li PTA. And they said of the inner ring suburbs around the, uh, in the Monroe County, there were only two towns that didn't have their own libraries, Gates and chi -Li they relied on the city branches. Well, there were three women in that audience who took this to heart and they quickly began to work on this project. The first thing they did was to get the support of the Gates Town Board. And in November, 1959, they got the first budget for Gates Public Library of $15,000. And they started looking for a central location for the library. They found the Gates Grange building, which was very close to Gates Center of Howard Road and Buffalo Road was available. The Grange had been a very important feature in the life of Gates because when it was primarily a farming community, um, the Grange was a very important socialization step for them. They built this building, the Grange Hall in 1915. And so it was no longer being in use for Grange meetings and we took it over. The entrance to the library was right where this white door is. And this is the book drop right here. There were many people who tried to use those front steps but they didn't open to anything. So these are the three women to whom we owe Gates Public Library. And they were on the first library board right here in the front. Charlotte York, who lived in Central Gates, Eleanor Freislich, who lived in South Gates, Edna Kemp, who lived in North Gates. And for those of you who remember the country gentleman, this is Ralph Johnston, who was president of the library board. The country gentleman was the hardware store for Gates on Chi Lai Avenue. And behind all of these are our wonderful volunteers and early employees who first got us started including Madeline Wankard, who was a librarian on loan from the Monroe County Library System. This gives you a picture of what the inside of the Grange looked like during this time period. Our first circulation desk and Edna Kemp is behind the circulation desk with Eleanor Freislich and Neil Redding uh, out in front. So these are, this is the reference area and this is, I figure about 1961 uh, the library had opened January 3rd, 1961. So that's what we take as our anniversary. But the uh, pegboard you see behind you was uh, the entrance to the stage, which eventually became used for fiction. It's interesting to note that these yellow tables have had a continuous life with the library. They are now being used in the Elm Grove location for the staff kitchen tables. The first library director was Lois Klonick, and she served between November 61 through January 64, essentially two years, and she left to take care of a special needs child. I came aboard in September of 1965, fresh out of library school, and I immediately started planning for a new library about 8,000 to 10,000 square feet, but state consultants had advised us that libraries in Monroe County were building too small and they pledged that we would get 
uh, 35% federal aid, LSCA aid, if we would build a library of at least 15,000 square feet. So that's no problem for me, I can do that. So we developed a plan for a library for 15,000 square feet, actually it was 16,405 square feet. And what we are looking at, Loretta Brooks, who was president of the library board, is the letter that we got from the state that's saying that we will get the 35% federal aid to build a library, essentially a third more library at no cost to Gates taxpayers. So this shows you what the library looked like as it was started to get crowded. This is 1966. Pauline Bright is behind the circulation desk and this is the Record Act. And the Record Act was the film circulation system that we used between 1964 and when we automated in 1988. And it basically had customer's card, the book card, and the punch card, date due card that we used to send down to the central library and the central library would collate them and we would look them up on the film that was located on the very top of the machine right here, 100 feet of film. So you can see how crowded it started to get at this point. In order to do story hours in the Grange, we had to hold them before the library opened. And this shows Gigi Wicks on the steps doing a story hour and the kids sitting on their little sit upon cushions, we move the tables out of the way. They'd have a couple books and then they finish up with a film. You see the 16 millimeter projector here. So we started planning for the new library and it was a bond issue. And this is the Gates Chilai Library Club, and they were very helpful to us. They're in the Grange. They're going to help us uh, with the publicity for the bond issue. The first bond issue that uh, we went for was defeated. It was Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1966, and we got bombed out. And that's the first time I met Bill Gillette was sobbing, the tears rolling down my face in the basement when the vote went down. Well, the powers that be decided that they were going to go for another vote as soon as possible. We would do some trimming of the, um, the costs of the building. And we were successful on Valentine's Day, 1967. So then we dedicated the new library in 1969 and this picture shows the first day that we opened, our new circulation desk had not arrived, our new record act had not arrived, and you have Lynn Willard here typing library cards on those ubiquitous yellow tables, um, and Grace Baker, our wonderful volunteer, checking people out. So that's the 60s, that's the beginning. Over to you, Paula. Thank you, Sue, and since I was Fairly alive for most of this decade. Sue will help me out with some of the background info. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. So okay. I will be covering 1970 to 1979. And in 1969, we moved into our second permanent home, which is 1605 Buffalo Road, which is where the current Gates Town Hall is and the current Gates Parks and Recreation Department is. Okay, and there you can see the front of the current town hall. Okay. Sorry. Night. Oh. All right, Sue, next slide, please. Okay. Okay, 1970. Now in our new building, we have our first teen services librarian and who was Karen Biggs. And as you can see, Karen Biggs, our children's librarian, Lynn Willard, and our library page, Pat Bernhard, who became a library director at Henrietta, and Jenny Probst held a fabulous 50s program complete with a really cool, nice looking jukebox, which I wish I owned. <laughs> And here is our Gates Chile Chamber visiting the library and getting a tour from our very own Sue Slant in there in the front very of the Very pregnant side. with my son. <laughs> okay. So next slide, please. Yep. You can see we already had records then. Oh, yep. The records and the tables in the children's area. So this is Lynn Willard. Um, Big Z. 
Oh, Karen, Karen Biggs. Biggs, I'm sorry. Boarding yep. the bus for the uh, Live and Learners program. Pantsuits came in then. And Karen Biggs helped start the library group Lives and Learners, which took trips. And that trip was to the Sonnenberg Gardens. That's where the bus was going. Yep. This is Congressman Barbara Conable in the middle presenting reference books to the library in 1972. On the left is Taft Orabora, the Gates Public Library Library Board President, and um, Joe Campbell, the, the then Gates Town Supervisor on the right. And this is and Lynn Willard doing his playground story time. Um, she actually was went to schools and playgrounds doing story times outside. And as you can see, at least one of the kids in the back looks like they're having a lot of fun. And, and we, we pre-COVID, we did have this at our library currently, but here is a group of children from um, touring the library and, and there were scout troops, children's school, the schools coming. And it was a lot of fun because the kids really do like coming to the library to look at the library. Next slide. Um, the 1976 library float in the town parade, Gates Town Parade. And this is a float that the staff actually built. And as you can see, the town, uh, the signs say free libraries, free people. And Sue, could you give us a little bit of background on this float? Yes, Lori Brangle, who was the librarian at that time, um, the teen librarian was the one that put the, the float together and we marched along the parade route. It was really nice when the town had an annual parade. So this is two pages. <laughs> Um, Barbara Miner, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. This is, um, is it Jude Hanscom? Yep. And Sylvia Bullard. Sylvia Bullard, shelving books. And then you can see the frame prints in the back. And I know it's a little light, but you can see our paperback shelves along the back. Our 1970s, four library board members with town board member Betty DePonzio. It's left to right, Barbara Miner, town council woman Betty DePonzio. Sam Palma, Mary Fiorito, and Gail Solomon. They were wonderful library board members and wrote many, many policies that still stand the test of time. Okay, to the 1980s. And the library service continued to expand and we have the start of library, public library automation. We were going to start with circulation first. And the library celebrates its 25th anniversary in 1986. The Friends of Gates Public Library got restarted and Gates population was at its peak at 29,756 people. So here we have Nancy Blonda, the first adult services librarian for Gates Public Library, presenting the Gates Human Services Directory to Muriel Lind, who was the station manager at Dunn Tower One. Human services directories were a compilation of local information that libraries had gotten into the practice of self-publishing to help uh, provide the information that people were looking for. And this is guaranteed to give you a laugh. This is our very first computer. It was a donated Timex Sinclair. And this is 1983, Supervisor Jack Hart and library board president Sam Palma are looking on while I'm trying to figure out from the directions how to operate this thing. Then we have um, a picture of our circulation desk with our first video cassettes that were circulating. Hattie Utaro is on the left. She is now the director of the Monroe County Library System. Jillian Bauer is behind her and we have Jude Hanscom again. Here we have a wonderful party for our 25th anniversary. And the welcoming table is staffed by Al Roach, standing Beverly Maglioco, and Sam Palma is seated on the right. And it's the entrance to the children's section. And I love this picture of five former Gates librarians. It's very nice to see our librarians go on to become uh, library directors in their own right. On the left, we have Marvin Andrews, who became the director at the Webster Library, Deb Nevin, who worked for Rochester Public Library, 
Terry Bennett, who succeeded Marvin as the library director in Webster. Claire Maloney became a librarian in Greece. And Tom Blonda was the branch head for the Lyle Branch Library. So one of the first things the friends did when they got started was to participate in the town parade. And I still have this banner. It's all rolled up here in the library. And the very first president of the Friends of Gates Public Library was Margaret Dunlay, Al Roach is next to her, Joan Lucas, and Sam Palma again with an, an antique car. The Friends will be 35 years old this year. And they have, they started taking care of our book sales and they still take care of our book sales. Then the junior friends started in 1988. Joan Rubin, who was the teen librarian then, uh, started the junior friends. And thanks to Heidi Young, who is the teen librarian now, the uh, junior friends are still going and they've been a wonderful, wonderful stepstone for many people who went on to become library employees. Well, as we were talking about circulation becoming the first step for automation, in 1988, we had to prepare for circulation by having a new circulation desk built. So what were we going to do to keep the library open while this was being built? We had our meeting room set up so that people would enter the library through the meeting room, go through the story hour room into the library, and you have Debbie Shanker behind the, the, the record act. Yes, we were still using the record act. Gail Ramsey and Jim Montione over here. And here we are, we've gone live. Those are the first computers in 1989 and Sandy Kilberry is checking out one of our very first customers to use GX. Does anyone remember GX? Over to you, Paula. Hey, 1990 to 1999, as you could see, it brought more library services and increased technology and more automation, including OPAC, the online public access catalog, which replaced our card catalog. And as you could see in 1990, the Gates population was 28,583 people. There's our uh, former desk aide, Gail Ramsey, at the media checking desk. We had a separate media checking desk because we received so much media. Back then there were cassette tapes, CDs, books on tape, books on CDs, video cassettes, records, records, uh, books and cassette for the, for the kids. We just had so much media to check that we needed our own separate media desk that the staff could sit at to do the media in relative quiet and privacy. And here is, as you can see how busy it is, this is a Neil Armstrong visit visiting the library in 1994. And there's uh, Lori Bronco at checking out and one of our desk aides, Sadie Jones. And as you can see, 1994 shows the library to be a very busy place. And as you can see, we used to have those old bank rope lines, which we did eventually get rid of because <laughs> it was too much of a hassle and they always got knocked over by the kids, so. Uh, there's our former clerk, Sue Saylor, with our public typewriters. Yes, we let the patrons use typewriters, and they were very popular. They were always being used, and it seems weird now with computers, but yes, we had actually two typewriters for the patrons to use, and they were definitely used. <laughs> uh, 1993, our first drive-up window service, actually the first in New York State, people could drop books off, videos off, DVDs, and from 315 to 845, we actually let people come to the window to actually pick up stuff and they were even were allowed to pay fines. So, and we actually increased our circulation because we had more stuff dropped off because people from other libraries were coming and dropping their stuff off at our drive up window. Ah, the old card catalog, which when it went away, people were very dismayed that it went away <laughs> and kept it asking for it back. But of course, now we have the card catalog. And if you don't remember the actual cards, you would bring it up to the desk with the subject heading that you wanted. And we would help you find the book that's on the card. 
Well, hopefully you would leave the card in the card catalog. Wow, well, that didn't always happen, we're, we're, unfortunately. We're some people, we used to have scrap paper there. <laughs> and of course, that when we got when we had the computer catalog, that um, card catalog went behind the circulation desk and was used to house our cassette tapes. Next slide. Oh. 1994, our literally delicious library cookbook fundraiser. We had a committee here at the library who wrote letters to famous people, both in New York State, in Rochester, and nationwide to contribute recipes to the Gates Public Library cookbook. We got recipes from Ronald Reagan, Stephen King, um, several staff members donated recipes. And we actually still have two copies of that book in the library if you want to check it out. <laughs> Next slide. There's our children's librarian, Mary Jo Smith, checking the phone storyline for preschoolers. We, we used to have a storyline for the phone where people and kids, the families and kids could call in and have a story read to them over the phone that was pre-recorded by Mary Jo Smith, our children's librarian. And that is actually our story hour room. We had a separate story hour room where they had uh, kids story times. For the Gates Charlie Post, our then director, Sue Swanton, wrote a library link column that was featured prominently every week in the Gates Charlie News. And it was very popular. And she actually answered people's previous email or people's previous mail and letters to her in her next column. And we actually still have many of those columns in our scrapbooks. So Saturday afternoons was reserved for um, films. We had families come in and watch the films. As you can see, it's surreal and very old fashioned, but we had our pages run the films and they were very popular. Probably I'd say 40 to 50 people per movie. Next slide. Evening story times um, with our assistant director, Judy McKnight were also very popular. And as you could see, she has either a stuffed animal or a kind of puppet, because we did have a puppet theater um, back then in the old building. Uh, 1996, that is one of our desk aides, David. He is showing patrons how to use our new online catalog. And as you can see, there's a huge crowd because this was such a huge deal back then, 1996. I mean, the internet had been around, but it was kind of still in, it, in its infancy. And online card catalog was just a brand new thing. So there was a lot of interest in being able to use the computer to look up books. Pauline Bright, our first assistant library director, previously the children's librarian, and that is her desk, which is by our magazine slash reference section. We had a series of two public computers. As you can see, they were by the records and um, some CDs there. And people, you can see how bulky they are. They were kind of more like word processors, but people would use them to, you know, do assignments, documents, type letters, you know. And like I said, like the typewriters, they were used very frequently. Aha, here is Sue Swatton showing the Gates Town Board our first graphical online catalog in 1998. That's Sue Swan, and looking over her shoulder is Ralph Esposito and the rest of the Gates Town Board. Sue, do you want to give a little more background on this photo? All right. All right. Jim O'Neill, uh, John DeCaro, Ralph Esposito, John Maggio, Elaine Tett, and Greg Hart are the uh, town board members. They came over after a town board meeting and it may not have been graphical internet by that time. It might have just been text only. I'm trying to look at this computer in the front, uh, but I remember what they wanted to see was the town website and also what the web page for the New York Yankees. Okay, so that is the end of the 1990s. Here you go, Sue, with the 2000s. Okay, 2000 to 2009. Actually, I'm going to 2000, 
uh, in 11, the, the start of when we left the, the library. So there was a lot of turnover in library directors during this time period. In 2002 brought us our first electronic books. And here I am for a reporter holding up in my right hand, a digital audio book. The first MP3 book uh, was called a DAB, digital audio book. And in my left hand right here, I have a rocket book, which uh, was pure text and it had several books loaded on it. it was a rocket book. So I used to quip that I had come in in paperbacks and left in uh, electronic books. When I first became a librarian in 1965, everyone was saying, why does the library have paperbacks? You can buy them in any corner store. The library is for hardcover books only. No, the library book is, uh, the library is for whatever people learn from. So whether it's um, electronic or audio, whatever, we all learn from them. So I retired in 2003, but as you can see, I just really didn't go very far. I went back to volunteering. And so Judy McKnight, who was the assistant library director, became the third library director and she served for five years with Donna Peasley as the interim director from 2007 to 2008. Then in 2009, Karen Case McLaren became the fifth director and here she is being uh, warmly welcomed by uh, the community with uh, town board members, Frank Alcoffer and Elaine Tett beside her. Oops. Then we went to celebrating our 50th birthday. We like to party in the library, work hard, play hard. So here we are with the speakers for our 50th. Patty Utaro, Karen Case McLaren and two wonderful library board members, um, Bob Renahan and Peter Derry and our wonderful town supervisor, Mark Assini, who was so instrumental in us getting the library location we have here. So this was really the swan song for 1605 Buffalo Road. This gives you a look at what the computers were like in that building. There were a total of 16 there were on four tables. There were four tables or four computers on that standing. There was one 15 minute computer for um, OPAC only online catalog. And then there were the, the 12 here and they were always busy, always busy. The library was built on a 17 inch concrete slab with no basement underneath. So in order to get wiring to these computers, we had to come over the ceiling. And that's why we had a forest of um, power poles. And this is, shows the children's area with Diane Sosha, one of the clerks for the library, uh, showing how crowded that area had become. This is the reference area in the old library. And again, you can see that was very crowded. This was the audience that we had for our 50th. And over here in the corner, you'll see where, where the server was. The server that uh, handled all our computers. And here we have our wonderful Mary Jo Smith, the mistress of ceremonies, with our wonderful Donna Andalina, and they're doing the raffle pull for our 50th anniversary. We did publish a book, I think, a number of retirees that helped me put this book together. It's still available for purchase for a dollar at Gates Public Library's bookstore. And this was the swan song for the 1605 Buffalo Road. You can see a number of people there. Okay, last decade to you, Paula. All right, 2011 till the present. We moved to 902 Elm Grove Road in a two-story rented building across from Rochester Tech Park. 24,384 square feet, which is an increase of 8,000 feet from the square feet from the former library. More computers added, more electronics, technology improved. The 2010 Gates population, according to the census, was 28,400 people. There is the outside of our building. This is before we opened. So this is the, um, the outside of the building. And as you can see, the spacious parking lot and the two-story building. 
our huge atrium, very open spaced with modern chandelier in our new library. As in 2011, our library at the time was very modern and very in style. And as you can see, the very bright, colorful children's area, the different colored rugs, the different colored furniture, just more inviting and warm for the children's area. Our grand opening, here's our nice cake from June 24th. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, on to the next slide. And when we had our grand opening, it was also um, around the time of summer reading started. So we had a joint grand opening with the, the opening summer reading program kickoff. And as you can see, the kids are getting their bags and their um, raffle tickets and their, their book lists and everything to join the summer reading program. There's our gate supervisor, Marcassini, and this is at the grand opening and he's just giving remarks at the podium. And of course they're in the atrium. That is our children's librarian, Mary Jo Smith and Heidi Young, our teen librarian, Chad Cunningham, our clerk. There's Karen Case McLaren, our then director. There's Maggie Brooks to her side. And there's Bob Ranahan taking photos and they are officially cutting the ribbon for our new grand opening. And here is our current public computer space, 26 public computers, um, 18 downstairs, and then eight upstairs. And it's double the number of computers in the former library and obviously more spacious. And here is a picture. This is a view from the second floor with the chandelier. This is on the side by the nonfiction area. And as you can see, the, the bright windows, the sunlight, and just the overall increased space that we had. Here's our expanded teen section. Um, there are currently four computers in our teen section. Of course, they're not being used now because of COVID, but you know, more tables, the teens having their own area, having their own comfy seating. And it was very inviting and very much appreciated by our teen patrons. Here is Greg Benoit, our sixth uh, Gates Public Library director, who was the director from 2012 to 2019. And he also served as the Gates Charlie Chamber of Commerce president at the time. Here's our Ideas and Authors Reading Group that started in the 1970s and continues now with um, Heidi Young leading that group. And this is when they meet, met in person, obviously, in our meeting room. 2016, for a few years, this is the one from 2016, but for a few years, Downton Abbey was the most popular program in the country. And for like three years running, we had the final of the one season. We had we showed it at the library and we had probably close to 100 people, not only in the meeting room, but uh, spreading out to the atrium as well. And it remains one of our, the most popular programs we've ever had here. And we even had our own tea and people dressed like Downton Abbey times. And it was just a great adult program that we brought to the community. In 2015, this is a bingo program run for preteens um, by our teen librarian, Heidi Young. And Mary Jo Smith and Hannah Baumgartner, our two children's librarians, had um, every Friday, they were having preschool dance parties super popular, the kids love them. They had balloons all over the place. And hopefully once COVID has receded, we can bring them back again. And in April of 2015 with um, funding, thanks to Senator, then Senator Joe Robach, we have a early learning center. And this is the ribbon cutting with a bunch of, I think they're from the YMCA preschool kids cutting the ribbon for our new early learning center. And this is our current uh, library director, Anna Swanavong. If you're looking at the picture, she would be on your right. And then Carla Vasquez, one of our library board members on the left. And of course, this is our current reality. These are our current COVID-19 hours and how our, the pandemic has impacted our services. We have socially distanced public computers, um, Patrons have to come in wearing masks. 
We've roped off the comfortable seating. People can sit at the tables two per person with masks on. And we've taken a lot of precautions, quarantining books to help protect the public and staff. Okay. Come on. Yay! Yay! Happy 60th. No cake, unfortunately, yet, but you know, hopefully soon. <laughs>